Thanks, Jamie. Um, sure. Welcome, everyone. Jamie, you, you want to just go ahead and start with a roll call? Oh, sure. Randy. I, I'm here. <laughs> Abel. Here. Jessica. Here. Maggie. I'm here. Kathleen. Here. Marla. Here. Bennett. Here. All right, I think I hit all of you, right? Did I miss anyone? Excellent. Oh, thank you. <laughs> all right, so I'll, I'll open us with um, our, our land acknowledgement to begin our time together with um, this acknowledgement honoring all indigenous people, the people who came here before us and nurtured this place as stewards of Mother Earth, the first people. I make this acknowledgement aware that this land is unceded and that issues of water and territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are ongoing in the Wabanaki homeland. I acknowledge the Awaskawag people who once lived in what is now Scarborough and that as we support efforts for land and water protection, we honor the current tribes who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Um, welcome everyone to our late September meeting. The last time uh, we met or you all met, I wasn't able to join you then, was uh, in late July. And it feels like a lot has happened since that July meeting. Um, so as going through the minutes and seeing everything coming up and so many of those um, events and happenings have happened. So a lot of great work on the part of this Conservation Commission and all the different groups that we've been um, supporting as liaisons or informally. Um, thank you to everyone. So uh, I'm happy to entertain a, is Karen speaking? Yeah, sorry. We just had um, a member of the public join us in person. Oh, okay, okay uh, great. <laughs> Um, so I, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I'll motion. Thanks, Abel. Thanks, Abel. And Jessica seconded. Um, Jamie? Sure, we will roll call. Uh, Randy? Abstain, I wasn't there. Marla? Um, yes. I approve. Uh, Thank As you, we're... Kathleen. Yes. Maggie. I'm trying to see if I was there. Yes, I will. <laughs> Jessica. Yes. And Abel, forgive me. Have you been made? Yes, you are a full voting member. Abel. Yes. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. I'm so sorry, guys. It's all good. Thank you all. Great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Again, a lot has happened since then. We've got a few pieces that we're bringing forward to talk about tonight, which is um, to update you all about the conversation that um, Pete and I, on behalf of the Conservation Commission, had around environmental standards with the um, the engineers who were working with the developers. And then we also had a member from the Long Range Planning Committee as part of that. So we'll talk about that and talk about what next steps are coming up from that. Um, Sounds like what we'll have something to talk about with planning board submittals. No, there's nothing relevant nothing this to month. Look at. Um, uh, but I'll circle back around to that when we come to um, uh, commission business. So under new business, uh, we have a few things that have been coming to the attention of the commission around tree protection and uh, pesticide management outside of um, the uh, town pesticide management uh, work uh, the town pro on the town properties. So we'll talk about where we want to go with those two issues. And then um, in your newest packet, just want to make sure everyone was able to see the draft for the annual report and we'll we'll review it together and give a thumbs up or discuss what else we'd like to see in it. And then uh, the uh, at a recent town council meeting, there has been a change to um, committee term limits. And um, the thing that I wanted to circle back about was uh, the linkage with the planning board on the conservation commission. And then we'll just have um, some updates as usual. Is there anything else that folks 
that's on folks' minds. Um, I think as part of the updates, we'll talk about the land bond, which is now uh, the measure is officially on the ballot for $6 million. And then an update on the open space plan, which I know that group with Maggie as our representative have been pretty busy. It looks pretty exciting what's coming together on that. Um, and then sustainable Scarborough Day. So anything folks want to add? Randy, I'd like to add a PMAC update um, just to for a look ahead to what's um, what the commission will be taking up uh, next meeting. Um, there will be okay. some information coming to the commission about that. Great. Let's add that under, make sure we talk about that under new business. Um, and then anything else? All right, folks, let's get started and welcome. We have um, any members of the public who would like to make remarks. Like to make a comment tonight? Uh, yes, I would. Um, you Welcome. Can go right ahead. Thanks for just sharing me. Okay, my name's Ann Blanchard. I live here in Scarborough for over 40 years. And um, myself and the other neighbors, we have a number of neighbors on the street that are becoming ill um, immediately after the mosquito squad is spraying um, the property of one of the neighbors who is our road is on a bit of a hill and you know everything goes down and at the end of our street is the marsh we, we live in the marsh and your i both myself and the, and the other neighbor who live close to the neighbor that is spraying are ill, we have to vacate our property or close the windows. We can't go outside. We're experiencing sore throats, earaches, stuffy nose, headaches. Um, and we have spoken to the neighbor and um, they're not open to our uh, what's been happening to us after they spread. So what we've, the way we're dealing with it now is we find out when the mosquito squad is coming and we make plans not to be at our home um, during that time, which is, I'm retired and I'm, I'm at home. And so it's a, it's a bit frustrating. So, and there's, what we've found is there's nothing that we can do that this is, they're allowed to spray insecticide and let it go into our homes and into the marsh and there's nothing to be done about it. So that, that's why I'm here. And um, thank you, Ms. Blanchard for coming. Usually this is an unusual night because um, I'm, I'm under the weather. A couple of other members are under the weather and we have hybrid meetings. Um, at any other time, you would be joined by a number of other <laughs> conservation commissioners in the room with you. So this is unusual. Thank you for coming out tonight to uh, raise your concerns. And we'll be talking about that, as I mentioned, um, when it comes up on new business. Um, so thank you. Uh, any other any other public comment? Uh, I'll just make a really uh, quick comment. Um, uh, there is a, uh, effort to support the land bond on the ballot, um, including, uh, going, uh, doing some door to door, um, canvassing, uh, the weekend of, of October 5th and 6th. So, you know, if you have any interest in helping out, uh, please contact me and I'll get you in touch, uh, with the right people. Um, and if you want any information on the land bond, uh, if you want, um, a yard sign, anything like that, uh, please reach out to me and again, I'll connect you, um, and hopefully, uh, voters will support the land bond and we can continue to move forward with conservation in Scarborough. Thank you. And, um, 
this is Andrew Mackey speaking, and you, uh, you're, we're to contact you at the Scarborough Land Trust. Yeah, you can just uh, contact me at work, and I will um, put you uh, together with the committee. Great, thank you, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Jamie, is there anyone else? Uh, nope, there's no one else on Zoom. Okay, no great. one else in the room. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, unfortunately, Pete is one of the ones who is unable to join us tonight. Um, he he and I both were at the environmental standards discussion, the roundtable that we had in August um, in lieu of the Conservation Commission actually meeting uh, with engineers who are working directly with developers. And um, uh, I want to thank Autumn and Jamie and Angela uh, for coordinating uh, and pu pulling this together, co coordinating, a, I think, a productive meeting. It was tense at times, as uh, can be when you hold opposing views about something or you feel threatened um, about um, your your position or desires uh, might be taken away. Um, but overall, I thought it was a, um, um, a, a good conversation. And uh, as you note, noted in the excellent notes that Jamie put together, uh, we did come up with an initial agreement for pr uh, proposed ordinance um, standards. This, these aren't standards that we put forward in our pro initial proposal. They don't go as far as what we would like, um, uh, but they establish something which is 100% more than what we have right now in, in the town. So, um, Jamie, Autumn, Angela, anything you'd like to add or provide color before we open it up for discussion? And you could also talk about what are the next steps from here? Yeah, I'm happy to um, go over next steps and we'll share the outcome and then go over next steps. Um, and Angela and Autumn, feel free, and Karen, since you were there as well, feel free to, to chime in. Um, so the resolution or the agreement that the folks around the table came to was that as a first step, we would um, work towards establishing um, a 25 foot setback around all wetlands, uh, regardless of size. Um, and within that 25 feet, 15 feet will be a vegetated buffer. Um, so if you recall right now, we've got no setback around wetlands and people can go right up to the edge. Um, so that is um, some incremental progress there. And the folks around the table agreed to um, reconvene um, in January to discuss um, additional next steps. So looking at other um, setbacks and buffers around other natural resources. And by that time, um, we should have a better idea of what um, DEP is going to mandate that the town adopt for low impact development standards. Um, and so that will likely have additional setbacks that we need to be um, looking at and, and incorporating into our ordinances. So it'll be a good opportunity to have a, some stakeholder engagement around um, what we're going to have to do for that process. Uh, we'll be required to adopt low impact development standards into our ordinances um, by November, 2025. So, um, this isn't kind of where this ends. Um, we'll still continue working on um, getting better buffers um, and larger setbacks around natural resources. Um, this is just kind of the first step in the process. Thank you. And I um, I, I want to make sure to note that there were three town councilors present, Karen, our liaison to town council, um, uh, Jean Marie, Katerina, and John Anderson. And uh, I believe both Councillors Anderson and Katarina are on the Ordinance Committee, and you know that they had that already dedicated discussion with the with the developers. So this this was a time that they could hear from um, the Commission about our our thoughts, and there was that interest in in having that discussion in January. Um, uh, Karen, would you like to say anything about the the meeting? And where we are with it? Yeah, I mean, I think 
in my mind, our meeting was to get something on the ordinance agenda. So it's almost at first I was like, oh, it's such an awful compromise. But I mean, it was just we we got something on the books. I think for the next steps, I think there's a lack of education with the counselors. You know, Jean Marie is leaving, so she will no longer even be part of the picture. I think the more John Anderson hears, the more he is, you know, understanding and feeling confident about the recommendation that he's getting. Um, with a new council coming in, I think it's a good time to educate them on kind of why the, why we're doing this. And I think this gives us a little time to get that education together for them. Um, I think I can say that, you know, in my mind, this is something I was going to bring up later, but, you know, I'm already thinking about, you know, council goals for January. So trust me that this will be one of our council goals to continue to try to work at something along these lines. And it, it works well with the timeline that I think Jamie proposed. So um wasn't the best workshop I haven't been to many of those so um I think it just did, you know it wasn't going as well as I had hoped I was hoping to get more of it to move forward but you know I understand what we're doing now is what we need to do to get anything forward so I think you know we're going to keep chugging along with this and it's not dead at all I think this is a good compromise a quick good compromise I'd say thank you so I have a question yeah, Maggie. Is, is um, did we learn anything from this about better ways or ways uh, that we would want to um, use in the future to propose changes? Mm -hmm. I mean, is um, so I understand it was a tense meeting, and um, would it have been beneficial to um, to brief a couple of people ahead of time rather than splat here it all is to a group of people in a targeted kind of way. I'm just wondering about a communication strategy that, um, that um, I don't know, I'm just opening that up. Is there is there anything we learned that we could do differently next time? Let me um, tee it up before folks add, but really great question. And because we're gonna be pulling in more recommended changes to ordinances over time, right? So um, we, we, as you know, we worked on it for a year and uh, and then it was ready to go forward. It, it was brought to um, a forum with the developers and the um, counselors who serve on the ordinance committee. I think that was the tense meeting. Yes. Um, and sort of a, you, you know, uh, there were a lot of reactions in that meeting. Then there was an agreement to have a working group and uh, there were um, opposing views and strongly held views, but I um, it, I wouldn't characterize it as tense, the overall meeting. Um, uh, so I thought, I thought it was helpful to have that discussion. There were, um, there was, there was an initial conversation where Pete and I met with staff to um, prepare because we were asked to present um, our sort of point of view, as well as the developers, were, the engineers were asked to develop their, present their point of view. So there was a little bit of that. Um, um, but I, I wanted to sort of go back and say, I wouldn't characterize the whole meeting as tense. It was just, you know, we were at different, we were looking at it from very different perspectives. Um, and uh, overall, it was cordial overall. There were moments, but um, but really great question. And I don't know if that's something, Autumn, if if you want to pick up and sort of like, what, what have we learned about this process that maybe we could improve next time we come up with a, you know, you you really su supported a lot of this and are there ways that we could look at future changes in a different way? Uh, I would just add that when we look at future changes, you have to understand that this group is uh, a very sort of extreme perspective sometimes. And so it's important to get the perspectives of others early on in the process. Um, what we ended up getting forward to ordinance committee is what staff brought to you a year ago. And I feel, and I'm going to be very frank, I feel like if we had just moved forward with that a year ago, 
right now we would be further along. Mm -hmm. And so I sometimes what I have found um, in working with different groups and personalities and interest, the small steps really are the way to get these things done, especially when you're so, so opposing and, you know, the, the end goal. Um, so in, in and, and I do want to say John Anderson is not on the ordinance committee. Um, oh, excuse me. Then. It's Don Hamill, April Scyther, and Jean Marie. Okay. John Anderson just joined uh, the SEDCO. He's joined the SOR forum as part of SEDCO. Got when it. we have the developer forum, because when we took it to ordinance committee, they um, they are the ones that said, you know, we need to go talk to the business community and the development community and and get some more feedback. So that's what what started that. But the whole time, the whole year, we've been showing the draft and it's been online and we've been talking about it. So it wasn't a huge shock to anybody, Maggie. It was just an opportunity for them to say, ah, we hate this, you know, and kind of to, to throw a fit, for lack of a better word. And so I agree. Um, I thought that the meeting we had, the roundtable was, was much better than it, it could have gone. And, you know, we... Ultimately, we'll get something on the books. And so now we have the framework set up to get more. And I think, uh, like Jamie alluded to, the the stay requirements that are coming down later in the year are just going to help us. And we'll already be ahead of it because we've already got something on the books, hopefully. <clears throat> Randy, I'd like to speak to that at some point. Is that um, Angela speaking? Oh, no. Yeah. Aaron, I just, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Angela had her hand up and then we'll come back to Karen. I just um, wanted to quickly, I guess, piggyback on what Anna was saying from kind of the different point of view, because I also know that the developers and their engineers are also coming from an extreme spot and any change is going to feel extreme to them. So I feel like, well, I hope this group doesn't feel defeated at all because I feel like it is kind of the long game. We got to start. And I think we kind of ripped the bandaid off a little bit and now we can keep kind of beating the drum. And I think it gets them a little more time to acclimate to changing times, right? This is coming. We're going to keep moving with it, but starting with us, I think a pretty small step. I mean, obviously we would all like to see, um, more but it opens that door which before was closed i feel like so um as far as lessons learned i feel like i think we just have to keep marching along in a steady pace rather than a sprint through this you know um so i think i'm optimistic in that regard i'm just gonna realize we are kind of gonna have to deal with an extreme opposing view, right? And so we just need to keep moving at a steady pace towards where we need to be. Thank you, Angela. And um, Karen? Sure, so, I mean, I am your town council liaison, so I've only been a councilor for two years. So I think I've learned a lot through the process. I think there was an error made because I've been working with you guys for the last year on this ordinance, but that first workshop I was not invited to. And John Anderson said to me last week, if you were at that first workshop, Karen, I probably would have had a different perspective and it probably would have gone differently. I also personally as a counselor am concerned about the value that the developers are having over this process. I personally, if it's sitting before me, I understand they have rights, but I feel like they were just developers. I, I still don't know what landowners are going to be affected. There was a, it was just a lot of like, oh no, we don't like this. We don't like this. It wasn't very productive. I felt like we didn't have time to educate the proper counselors on how to push this forward and have the meeting go in a manner that I think could have gone better. Um, again, I it's confusing to me. I'm only been a counselor two years. Why the developers' feedback is so important to this process. Yes, we want their feedback, but to have it stall this whole process at this point, I don't like. Um, it's a little confusing to me that this is this is the process at times where counselors would like to continue this and explore this process. And I mean the the ordinance, and we will. And I've learned a lot, and I think there's just a huge curve of, ed of education that needs to be done for the counselors and who's really going to be impacted. And I think that just while we get it. It, we didn't even get the we we didn't get the opportunity to really educate the right people. I think to get where we needed to go, and I think I've learned a lot. So, 
please have faith that I'm going to continue this on and that with the next ordinance, I think I've learned a lot and hopefully it'll go smoother. Thank you. I, uh, I think in, in, um, in reflecting on the views that were shared in that meeting, oh, uh, there were a few statements that were pure hyperbole, uh, of extreme thoughts that, you know, it was said, uh, development will pull out of Scarborough if this goes through kind of thing. So I just find we'll that- We'll dump into the marsh. Out. Pardon me? We'll dump into the marsh. Oh That's yes, that was another thing. thing that if you make us do this, then everything's gonna be directed straight into the marsh anyway. Okay. So there were a few statements like that that were, I found, um, completely unhelpful and um uh you know we're coming at it from having studied this in other communities and seen what works so um any any change in this ordinance would have gotten a reaction so um it's not what we wanted to the fullest but it gets us somewhere it makes a change that we need um that Scarborough doesn't have this already in place is not good, unhelpful to our values, our conservation values, and we certainly want to have something go ahead. Um, so Maggie, thanks again for the question. Um, and let's just keep it in mind as we move forward on other topics. So just to recap, please, on what's next with this. So um, there was a there was draft language in the packet for the um, the setback and buffer around um, wetlands. Uh, the goal is to bring that to the ordinance committee in October. Um, so feel free to provide comments and feedback um, on that language. The um, engineers that were sitting around the table at the round table have also received that draft and um, are invited to provide provide feedback. Um, ask, we're asking for it, Autumn is asking for it by October 4th um, so that she'll have time to make any revisions in time for the ordinance committee meeting. And then we'll see how that goes, um, if they move it along to um, council or if it needs more work. Um, but it, it seems like the people sitting around the table were in support of the concept. So we'll see if they're in support of the specific language that um, has been provided to them. And then, as I said, uh, we will reconvene in January to talk about um, additional standards and likely looking at low impact development and how that is going to fit into our ordinance. Um, and we're gonna have a lot less flexibility on that. The state's going to say what we need to adopt and we just need to figure out how it's going to fit into our ordinances. So um, that is going to be likely be a, a, a different discussion. They can push back all they want, but the state's mandating those changes. Any other questions or thoughts? Cable. Thank you. Yeah. And personal thanks to you, Randy, and, and Pete for having that conversation for everyone who attended. I, I wasn't necessarily jealous that I didn't get to go. So um, but I'm glad to hear that it, it went well enough. Um just just in general, from your sense, did did they get a pretty good understanding that we're kind of starting with nothing? And so that like, you know, sometimes people it's not what's right or wrong, it's what they're used to. So if the baseline's currently nothing it's all gonna seem like a lot to them, but that we need to put these in place. Did they kind of get that sense that like, we, this is just a starting point, right? And then this is kind of starting with a framework and it's gonna increase over time. They seem to kind of, I mean, as much as they could get on board with that. Right, Autumn, what would you say? I think they accepted that. <laughs> I don't know if they're, I, I think they're like, yeah, fine. We'll play with you some more in January. We'll do it again. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. Is that kind of what you think, Randy? I mean, yeah, I guess unless they're they they left the room and went and got more forces behind them. I, I haven't, know. you know, I sent out the draft and I haven't heard from anyone at all. I have not heard of Pete. Um, so I don't know. And I was gonna tell you all the ordinance committee is it's October 9th. 
And what usually happens is they'll recommend it go to council the next meeting, but since the next meeting would be right before the election and swearing in, it might not get in front of council until the 20th of November. Okay. Um, and so after that, just kind of have that, it would be really helpful if that goes to council on November 20th, that some of you were there to speak on behalf of it. I think that would be really great. Great. Thank um, you. But I'll, I'll keep you posted with what happens. And even at ordinance committee, I would encourage you to go. Uh, we'll be talking about food trucks and environmental standards. Okay. <laughs> okay. And the goal is to have this in place before the the push for uh, next construction season, which yep. I mean, autumn, you can correct me, is usually like January is when things start to pick up around planning board as people are looking for approvals. Uh, yeah, even later than that. I think as long as we get it in place, I'd say by January, we'd be doing great. Yeah, it's yeah. already starting to slow down a bit. Um, thank you, Marla. And then Jessica. Uh, real quick, I just wanted to thank you all, all of you who worked on this. Um, I remember meetings long, long ago when um, I was working on the pesticide uh, management policy for the town of Scarborough and um, the pesticide industry came out in full force. We had a lot of really tense meetings. It was, it was very challenging, um, but we kept going and we eventually had a victory. So um, I applaud you all. It's, it's hard work, but it's what we need to keep doing. So thank you. Thank you, Marla. Jessica. Um, I just have a question about how well known is it at, outside of the conservation commission that the low impact development standards from the state are coming. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we, we've been talking about it for a year. Do, do other town committees and developers understand that in the time frame? Angela? <laughs> yeah, I can, I guess, just mention that I, I think all of the design engineers that the civil engineers that are working for large developments and developers in town are well aware and they know it's coming. Um, and so I know in Scarborough, we've been specifically um, referring to it. And even when we do current reviews, talk about encouraging it because it's, it's going to be required. So we're, we're trying to get everybody used to it. It's, I think there's going to be an, a huge um, learning curve for the design engineers that are currently doing sites right now because they have an idea of what low impact development is and they are way off the mark and I keep pointing that out as they're coming through so um, I think it's going to be a little bit of a challenge just to get them to understand what that even means but they are aware it's coming <laughs> they just don't know what the impact will be I think Oh, Maggie. I think Jessica had her hand up before I did. Oh, excuse me. No, that was my only question. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, does the since the state is is going to be mandating some of this, does uh do, is the state uh going to possibly offer talking points or um things that we could other than just here's the mandate. Um, things that we could utilize as as a communication strategy around no. no no the state won't offer us anything <laughs> so we do have um there is a, a group of 14 municipalities working in this area and um scarborough is a member of that called the interlocal stormwater working group um and they may kind of come together to develop some talking points and things like that but no the state's going to hand it to us and tell us figure out how this is going to work in your ordinances. Okay. So it's a we're it's up to us how to implement. And so the so each town will be implementing it as they see fit. As long as it meets the mandated standards, yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm just trying to think if there's a if there's a well, I'll I'll think on it some more. Yeah, it's interesting to think about, you know, is there an educational component 
that this commission can put out that talks about the benefit to all for these standards that we've been at it for a while ourselves and we are happy to see this coming from the state kind of thing. That's a good idea. Thanks. Thanks, Maggie. Um, Abel and then Bennett. Thank you. Um, can anyone remind me like what the implementation timeline will be for them once they come out? So we'll have until November 2025 to adopt them and they will go into effect immediately once they're adopted. Okay. Thank you, Jane. So you, you know how long we've been discussing environmental standards. If <laughs> <laughs> um, right. it is it that's a, a tight timeline, especially since we've only seen a very rough draft of um the standards that are being proposed. They have there needs to be a lot of clarification and refinement. So um and we don't don't really have a timeline on when uh we'll get the the, the final. Actually, they haven't even released an official draft for comment yet. Oh, okay. So we've only seen a kind of a rough internal draft that they floated by the, the municipalities and some stakeholders to get their feedback, but they still have to do an official um, public comment process. Okay. Thanks, Jamie. Just good context to keep in mind. Thanks. Um, good luck to the people receiving the public comments <laughs> on <this. laughs> um uh Bennett and then Jessica again. Thanks. Yeah, I'm just you know, I was thinking with the, the state mandated stuff, um, you know, once we see what that is, you know, we'll have to evaluate whether we think it's, you know, if there's any room that we can improve upon it, great. But if if we can't, or we don't think it's hard to improve upon it, you know, we really can, we don't need to convince anybody that that's what we should do. We legally have to do it. So the, our battle is over unless we want to improve upon those standards, kind of. And so if there's anywhere that we can, like if it's, you know, if it says you need 25 percent buck, we're not gonna be able to say, well, we want 50. And we could try that, but good luck getting that past everything else. But like if if there might be some language that we can alter to make it just, you know, strongly encourage different different things. And I think we should look at, you know, how it's being written into how it um how it reads and and how we're looking towards the future for developing stuff. But I, I, we, don't, we don't really need much teeth to implement the minimum the state's requiring. I think that's just going to be, there's no argument to have for anybody unless you're going to, you know, it's already done or it will be already done. That's how yeah, I Yeah, and we, we won't be going it alone either. As I said, there will be 13 other communities around us that will be adopting similar standards. So for developers to say that they will leave Scarborough, they're going to run into this in every other urbanized uh, town around us. Um, and then as to Angela's point earlier, I'm just going to reiterate that um, education efforts would pro be probably best focused on educating um, the design engineers about what the, the standards actually mean and how they need to be implemented, um, because it is going to be a, a large difference from what they are currently doing and thinking is low impact development. And I, I think that that can happen in parallel with potentially the town or the commission supporting the town in communicating, like this is an advancement of our town values, our town values conservation, and you know, basically celebrating this, even though it's coming from the state as a mandate. And, you know, in, in Bennett's words, I think there's nothing more than we can do about it, but why not embrace it and say this is we're we're pleased to be moving forward together on something like this that's doing um right by what we value around our natural resources and that we see that you can have you can continue positive economic development while you're implementing good um conservation principles so um jessica this really reminds me of the conversation we had on the freeboard standard and it, for two reasons. One is that there might be small recommendations, not small, I don't mean it in that way, but there can be incremental improvements that could be made. So, you know, the freeboard one, two, three, do I have that right? One foot, two foot, three feet. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. um, uh, and an accelerated time frame. So I don't know that 
the Conservation Commission was able to make a strong case as it could have if there were more time on the free board recommendation to council. And if it don't want to have that repeat itself in the low impact design standards, if there are incremental changes that could be made that would be beneficial to the community and communicating what those incremental changes, how those incremental changes would benefit the community. Thank you. But without, but I don't know the standards well enough. I barely know what really see the standards yet. Yeah. So. <laughs> But just keeping an eye towards, are there incremental changes in parts that might be something we as a commission want to take a position on and provide education on? Thank you. Okay. Um, I say let's move on to new business um, with thanks for everyone's input and conversation around um, the environmental standards. Um, so we have a couple of issues that have been raised uh, in different ways, um, pesticide restrictions throughout the town uh, and uh, tree protection. Uh, Jamie, do you want to tee us up on, on this? And of course, we have a, a special guest who came tonight to talk about pesticide concerns. So, And we've been talking about this generally as a commission. We, we have um, absorbed PMAC, which is oversees the town owned properties. And we've generally talked about uh, what would it look like to apply pesticide restrictions uh, on private property in town like South Portland um, and other municipalities, but we haven't taken it much further. Tree protection, we've uh, mentioned a couple times, um, but uh, I'll just, Jamie, you want to tee us up for this conversation? Sure. And I'll also note we have another uh, member of the public who joined us who may want to chime okay. in on this conversation. So, um, yeah, the, uh, I think you did a pretty good job introducing it, Randy. So um, we have, um, as you mentioned, the commission's talked about um, uh, taking on a, a pesticide ordinance and proposing a pesticide ordinance. Um, it's it's been a topic of conversation for the six years that I've been here. Um, there hasn't necessarily been the political support um, on the town council to to move that issue forward, um, and so I think that's why the commission has not um, dedicated a lot of time um, to it. But it has been a, a topic that the commission has wanted to address for a while, um, and then we uh, the other. And then we started receiving um, e regular emails from um, residents who are concerned about pesticide use in their neighborhoods. And I'll just say anecdotally that um, when I am, you know, at speaking events or community events, um, the topic of pesticide 99% of the time comes up and people are asking um, why Scarborough isn't doing more on that front, um, especially people living in condo associations who don't have a say as to what is happening on the property around them. Um, and then we are hearing more and more as well from concerned residents about the tree cutting and the amount of development that is happening um, in Scarborough um, and concern of the, you know, just the, the cutting of trees um, happening throughout town. Um, we, back in the spring, we took a look at uh, South Portland's tree protection ordinance um, to, think about its applicability to Scarborough and there was some support, I would probably say strong support among the, the Conservation Commission um, to, to look to doing something similar um, here as well. Um, and recognizing that uh, this commission um, and your staff liaison can really only focus on um, one large uh, initiative uh, coming out of Conservation Commission at a time. Um, it would be helpful to have a, a discussion as a group to decide um, which topic, or maybe there's another topic not on this list that the commission would like to um, begin addressing now that we kind of have a, a reduced path forward with the environmental standards that's moving forward and other more is to come. But what else does this commission want to tackle? Thank you. And then uh, speaking about capacity, right? So the commission as a whole, but uh, I think it would be, 
critical actually to have one or two members of the commission kind of spearhead this, do some research and look into what um, other municipalities have implemented in sort of where kind of suss out where our where our barriers might be, where our opportunities might be, and then begin the process there. So as we we're talking about this, um, be thinking about that as well. I don't think it's wise for us to take up a new issue if we don't have um, and you know energy and capacity among us to to uh, lead the charge on that. Is that so? There's another member of the public that we haven't heard from yet. Uh, why don't we give them like a minute to comment, introduce themselves, and no, you're fine. Okay, so Hi, I apologize for being late. I'm Heather Robinson. I'm a neighbor of Ann Blanchard, who is already here. Um, and we were sort of here in solidarity um, because of our experience this summer with the Mosquito Squad and um, our neighbors who use it every three weeks. And I was just having researched the contents of what they're using every three weeks. Um, it's, I basically couldn't even have, begin to have a garden this summer. Um, and I was just shocked that the more I researched, um, the more I realized that Scarborough is really not, I mean, there's nothing a resident can do who is, lives adjacent to someone who wants to spray against mosquitoes um, with the conventional um, sprays, the sort of basic rate um, of, um, the, the, I mean, there are other options, but I, my neighbors are not the type, even if I offered to pay the difference, which John Anderson suggested I do. And I think I convinced him to change his use of the mosquito spot to the more environmentally sound um, option. Um, I have neighbors that that will not even discuss it. Um, so basically, we and Anne, who lives one house away, I live right next to these particular neighbors, but she, we both had serious um, like illness, like um, physical reactions to this, and had to vacate. Oh, I just had to vacate my house every single time for twenty four hours, lock the house up, put the cat inside, and leave. And it just occurred. I mean, do people even know in Scarborough what? And especially right on the marsh, because we live very close to the marsh, um, these chemicals are very, very toxic to fish and bees, um, they, not just mosquitoes, obviously. So it was just kind of a terrifying, like almost <laughs> apocalyptic summer. Um, and I was just curious to come to this commission and see if there are like-minded people in Scarborough A, um, and whether it's even possible to, to move forward on a topic like this. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry that you uh, had such a summer where you felt ill and, and had to leave your house as a result. Um, uh, Karen, I might ask because I, I there are times when I've been at uh, meetings or listened to them on uh, YouTube where during public open public comment, people would also speak to this issue of pesticides. Um, maybe there's others who have spoken about the issue of uh, tree protection. Uh, do you have a sense, Karen, what you've been hearing um, that has been addressed directly to council? I mean, I guess at, at the only perspective that I can give to this um, conversation is as a counselor, I, I started as on the planning board and the uh, property on the corner of eight corners when they were able to just like clear cut it. That was Part of the reason I got motivated to run was, um, you know, we don't really need to be clear cutting. I would say, I hate to say this, I actually have had no one ever come up to me and talk to me about pesticides, but I've had people consistently come up to me and talk to me about how clear cutting is happening all over town. I know planning board members are spoken to about clear cutting in town. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm looking forward to the conversation, but I will add, I have spoken to staff and a couple of town councilors about what our goals are, what we think we want to work towards. We do feel like pesticides is a hot issue, but I, and so I, I do have more to contribute to this conversation, but I don't want to like overshadow it by saying too much right now. Thanks. Um, I might ask Marla, if you'd be willing to give your perspective because of all your years of work on this, having developed the, the ordinance for the town managed pro properties 
um, and what you've seen since then, after the time where you, I guess, essentially dropped the issue for um, private property, uh, what what your sense is now uh, around pesticides, or you could also speak to tree uh, cutting. Okay, I think um, they're both really important issues. And um, you know, the thing about pesticides is that sometimes what people feel are their personal rights can infringe on other people's rights to um, breathe clean air and drink clean water, um, especially for, you know, some of us who live on the other side of town where, you know, we don't get municipal water. So um, those pesticides often hit non-target species and um, many of them are very toxic. And there are companies in Scarborough who do this, um, have this sort of business and that seems to be booming here. And when we started, um, you know, I started talking to the ordinance committee and this is like back in 2010. So this is a really, actually this is quite a, quite a while ago. And there were four or five towns in Maine that had either an ordinance or a policy. Um, one town council member, Karen DeAndre, she wanted to go for an ordinance, but it was not going to go anywhere. We could not get a townwide ordinance. We didn't, ordinance. We didn't support. Have support. So, so we had some workshops. Uh, we had one on a town hall. Um, the industry came out in full force and um, I think it felt very concerned because this is you know for these businesses it is their livelihood um but things have changed quite dramatically because at that point south portland didn't have an ordinance and portland didn't have an ordinance nobody around here had one i mean probably the closest one might have been like kennebunk and there and camden and castine um so things have changed dramatically now we have some municipalities close by that have essentially banned them. Um, and they used, I know South, South Portland used it, and I maybe Portland as well, they use a tiered system. So they started eliminating it, um, I think for residents and then later for golf courses and maybe later for other properties. Um, yeah, I think it's a huge issue. And my, you know, I really feel for you. And I, and I, you know, I know other people who live in essentially condominium situation where they, can't control what is being put on their on on the the soil that's right outside their window. Um, it's a different time now than than back then. So, I mean, I would love to see a townwide ordinance restricting the use of pesticides in Scarborough. I would love to see that. I would definitely support that. I don't think I can lead that um, personally, uh, but I would support the commission going in that direction. But also, you know, the clearing of land is happening very quickly. It actually uh, <laughs> just happened over essentially the past week on, on Holmes Road. Um, a significant property was cleared, I mean, clear cut. And um, it happened fast. And there are groups that I'm part of, you know, like private Facebook groups for um, parents in Scarborough. And they talk about how fast the development is occurring. Um, how can you replace a forest? You know, I remember uh, watching the land cleared for the Costco and cleared for the development on Wesley Road and it's happening here and there and all over town. So they're both really important issues. I don't even know how you choose because we really need to work on both of them. So I don't know if that's helpful. Thanks, I don't Marla. Think you have to choose, so <laughs> you're saying you don't think we have to choose one or the other. And I and I I hate that this conversation is now a, a, a choice where I, maybe I should pretend and say that you know some of us counselors feel like we're going to move forward with the tree cutting ordinance because we feel like it's more in line with our thirty by thirty and conservation efforts. And so I think at some point it's it's going to move forward. It's is it going to move forward without you? Are we going to can we carve out one of the counselors' suggestion was can we just carve out 15 minutes of every minute of your meeting to have you at least touch it? I think that personally, and that's maybe you can get feedback from the, from the commission, I feel like that's something easier to push through because not as many people are impacted. 
where pesticides have impacts every single resident in this town. And I can already tell you one, one landscaper who lives in town and runs his business in town is asking when the first workshop is on it. So I think I just like, I'm new to this, but I also like, I'm, I'm saying like, that's kind of the conversations and like where I feel like some of this is going. Um, and I think, you know, staff has concerns about if the implementation of a pesticide ban. And I mean, I don't, I don't think it's going well for South Portland. Maybe you could probably speak to it more. Tom Hall just said it's disastrous is all he says. And so I think personally, I think we can do both. I know Jamie wants to die when I say that, but I think pesticides needs to be worked on a lot more, not with maybe just this commission, but like with a workshop or with like a working group or something like that. Just kind of the initial conversation I had with Tom Hall and another counselor, just because it is a very contentious issue. And it's also, we have two different sides. I think, I'm sorry, who brought it up before, who did the whole lead Marla before. Um, and so maybe if the, if the commission can speak to if they just want to do one or if they think they have the capacity to do two or if they what their recommendations are on being able to accomplish all of these things and ultimately again i, I felt like the tree protection ordinance was more in line with the goals that currently council is that the council has well and i just want to clarify just if we do choose just one it doesn't mean the other one is will not be addressed ever it just means that one will be the you know the next thing that the commission takes up. And um, just because something is hard and seems impossible is not a reason to not start working on on it too. Um, okay, so other uh, strong thoughts about uh, from commissioners about these two issues. Kathleen, thank you. I mean, for me, there they're both conservation goals, right? So like they're both really important and as insect biodiversity plummets um, and we're looking at such a, a huge number of insects become, you know, just going away. I think it's an urgent issue to think about working on, um, but I also feel quite passionately that the tree protection ordinance is something that's important and obviously in line with our goals. And I would certainly be willing to work um, on something um, just because I, I, both of those, and as someone who farms and like feels very strongly about um, trying to create diversity in the environment that I farm, um, this is, both things speak deeply to me and I feel like they're they're important for for all of us to have health Randy you're muted it was me I was calling on Bennett and I was like can you hear me Bennett <laughs> <laughs> and then Maggie after you yeah, I, I could not hear you or any, but I, I just did now. So um, I was just thinking um, related to, you know, two options kind of occur to me. And it sounds to me like Karen's saying that there's more will maybe with the the town and the political situation to deal with the tree ordinance. But I'm kind of wondering if that will maybe happen even without much participation from the commission, which maybe means it doesn't need as much of our current focus. Maybe that's not how what Karen meant, but that's kind of how I thought, you know, maybe she was implying, whereas the pesticide one may not go anywhere without, you know, some more input from, in, in, you know, workshops being established or anything like that. The other alternative would be to create, you know, if we want to work on both at the same time, maybe we have to create a couple of subcommittees that can do some emailing in between and then just sort of, rather than devoting, you know, 30 minutes, Per meeting to each topic, which will which is going to take a lot more time for everybody. If we if we had people kind of discussing each topic, you know, in groups of two or three people from the commission uh, in between meetings, and then they can kind of report on what you know what our general ideas were. 
you know, for a 15 minute discussion in each meeting, then maybe we could tackle both things at once. But I don't I think if we try and tackle both items as a full commission on every meeting, it makes it difficult to get anything done. Yeah, so that's, thank you. that's sort of where I'm thinking. Thank you. And we we do have experience of with that of having working groups um meet in between meetings and coming to the commission with their new thoughts on that. So I, I think it's that's what it's gonna take. Uh, Maggie and then Autumn. Hi. Um so I I guess I have I'm like Kathleen. I have I think both are important. Um I think the clear cutting is such a visible uh thing for everybody that it's that it's um to me that could make it easy much more easily a priority to work on um and i wonder if there's a if there's thinking about this in a phased in kind of way in that and i don't know personally i'm i'm on three committees right now so i don't think i can take on anything else but um i I real I if we could find a way to move forward with I don't know if it's a what kind of strategy it would be on the clear cutting and then take a more um, incremental approach and a and and a thinking through approach with the um, with the pesticide because I think it may be a little more complicated. I mean I think the the um, the clear cutting it's visible to anybody driving around town and you can and it's it's uh here's what's happening because of development i mean so i think it's 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 going to be easier to get a message across or to try to do something about it um uh because of that so i don't know if that was helpful at all okay. yeah thank you very much autumn yeah i was just going to echo um what karen said and maggie that the clear cutting um i get calls constantly about that. And I kind of think that putting something together for that would be an easier project, easier lift to get through. We may even, um, what we may want to talk about is, is timing. And like Jamie said, just because we, we have to pick one to work on first, doesn't mean the other one comes uh, pretty quickly thereafter. Um, but when maybe we could Internally, we could talk about putting some timing together because I think the clear cutting, especially with the six acres on Holmes Road that everybody's noticed and everybody's calling me about that I have no development proposal for. The only thing there is is a forest management permit. I would like to get someone from the forestry service to come maybe and have a council workshop and have members of the public ask questions and really because I've reached out to them before to get help when I've had other cases of clear cutting that in my mind it's for future site development, but I can't prove that because they're like, it's a commercial harvest and that's all we have. Um, so I think it might be an easier and faster, um, like Maggie said, and then pesticides is gonna be painful, um, but really needs to happen, right? We're getting lots of feedback from that as well, but I do think there's definitely an industry and that's going to be a more painful conversation but it could sort of be happening in parallel we could probably kick off tree cutting um maybe in the beginning of the year we have an understanding get some more information about the different uh forestry permits and property rights. You know, Maine is a, I'm, I'm from a place where trees don't grow back as quickly as they do in Maine. So it tears me up when I see people cutting down trees, but then after being here a few years, I'm like, well, they, they do grow back. Okay. Maybe this is why Mainers cut their trees. I don't know. I'm trying to get used to it. Um, but tree preservation, when we rewrote the landscape ordinance, we actually inserted tree preservation not requirements, but if you were going to do it, how to do it. Um, so that's in place. Um, I, I think we're probably just in a better spot to get that moving quicker. And then we could do pesticides, maybe um, kind of kick that off in the spring. But I, I agree. I don't know if a subcommittee is the right answer. Because I think ultimately every time we as staff probably need to bring you things to react to. I think that's 
easier when you're only meeting an hour and a half, two hours a month. Um, so that's just my two cents. Thank you. I, I think it does um, make sense to have one or two members of the commission be like Jamie's go-to for mm -hmm. uh, reaction stuff before we, and, and support before we look at these things as a commission. Um, I came from a place where there was more, I, I don't know what would be in a tree protection ordinance for our our town, but I came from a place where there was more precision language around trees. So um, for example, certain trees were called by their size and, and mm -hmm. uh, the type of tree champion trees. And if you as a property owner wanted to cut it down, you had to get permission um, and um, make some compensation uh, for cutting that tree down if you did get that permission to cut it down. And that's just one tree on a property and that, that's um, more precision than a clear cutting piece. So I, so I wanna just do a quick poll. It seems like there's general sense that uh, pesticide ordinance is important, but it's gonna take a while and it's worth our starting to direct some time on that. Um, but to prioritize for now a tree protection ordinance that sounds like there's existing language that we can look at, that there's some momentum on the town council to uh, pass this, that there's support in the community for it and concern in the community for it, that we could um, add some uh, uh, support to. Is that everyone's sense? Is somebody you know, sort of like, is that everyone's sense? Does that sound like a good way forward? Getting some general thumbs up and nods on that. Um, And thank you. All right, so that's how we'll go. Was that clear, Jamie? Yeah, okay. starting with trees and, and starting thinking about pesticides. Not and yeah, yeah, not not eliminating the pesticide ordinance, oh. just let's start picking it up and gird ourselves for the long <laughs> haul on that. Um, and I also heard, oh, go, go ahead, Kathleen. I I do wonder whether maybe with the pesticide thing, if there's an, if it's an opportunity for some like educational pieces around um, the impacts of pesticides or like the issues to human health or whatever, like somehow just to get some of those pieces out um, as small bits that would then begin to build some energy toward thinking about it. Um, I also just want to acknowledge like if we're in a if we're in a difficult conversation around the environmental standards, it's not wise to have another difficult conversation at the same time. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, thank you for that. And I even wonder if we could have a, um, a business, um, in that is working successfully in South Portland, talk about how they've been able to work within the ordinance. Um, like, let's just talk, have industry leaders talking about this. Um, okay. And can, Kathleen, I, can I just you... make one other one other comment and suggestion, Randy, for commission and members of the public that um, once this does start going before council at ordinance committee, this meaning the pesticide effort, uh, ordinance committee and then the town council, it'll be really helpful to have community members speaking in favor of it so that they're hearing from residents and not just industry people. So um, I think that that was one of the strengths of the, the effort that Marla worked on 15 years ago, getting our pesticide policy in place in Scarborough is that there was um, some, there was strong support from the community. And that's what this effort is going to take um, to get an ordinance passed in Scarborough. Thank you. Um, Kathleen, you offer to um, help. Are, were, was your offer also related to tree protection? Yes. Yes, great, thank you. Um, anyone wanna work with Kathleen? So to be the point people for Jamie to send early information to? Abel, are you raising your hand to do that? 
Yeah, I'd be happy to try to help if I can. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Question. Yes, yes. Does this commission have any say over the tree campus? Does, does no one comes to the commission for approval or any kind of? No. The only um, part of the town's ordinance that speaks to tree cutting is shoreland something. So that is the only time anyone needs to get approval to cut trees is if their property is in the shoreland zone. And that is pretty common throughout the state. So um, I'd just like to move into, um, oh, excuse me, then the next piece of new business, Jamie, your topic. Yeah, yeah so speaking of pesticides. So um, I just wanna give the, the commission a heads up that coming in October, um, Todd Sousa is going to join us to talk about um, their, Basically, the town's likely to uh, seek a waiver to the, the policy for grub issues. Um, they're starting to note grubs um, on or impacting playing fields and um, want to try to get ahead of it. They're starting to document the, um, the cases that they're seeing. Um, so he and I have had a conversation that, um, you know, unfortunately, with the grub life cycle, um, if if it's not addressed soon, it's going to affect the playing fields in the spring. And based on the grub life cycle, we can't really do any organic or biological control at this time in the year. So um, he and I are going to work on putting together a plan to address the current issue short term um, by doing some spot treatment like was done four years ago, the last time we had to deal with grubs um, and then putting together a plan um, to start implementing um, regular preventative biological controls um, so that hopefully we won't have to um, use the conventional methods to, to kill grubs in, uh, in playing fields. So that will be a, a topic of discussion coming in October because this group as the PMAC uh, will have to recommend either approving or not approving the waiver for the um, the application for grubs. Um, and just to give a sense, the application, um, the product they would use is a celeprin. It is not a broadcast treatment. It's a spot treatment where um, the issues are known um, and it wouldn't happen until the spring. So it's not anything the commission's going to have to take action on or make a decision on next month. It's just starting that conversation um, and educating commissioners because Marla is the only one that's been through that ro rodeo currently on the commission. That's all I have okay. to say about that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we'll hear more next month. Um, yeah. uh, so we have a draft uh, in moving to the next item of business. We have a, a draft of uh, our annual report submission. Um, I'll just Pull everyone with a thumbs up if you approve it as is. Um, and if you want to make any changes or adjustments, can you raise your hand in um, in Zoom? So raise hand or thumbs up. Okay. I'm looking at Kathleen. Um, I can't see it i don't know where it is there was, was a the, email that yeah, it was in the agenda packet um i couldn't see it i guess i somehow... i can share the screen or i can try re-emailing it to you whatever you prefer uh either way it's fine <laughs> it was um sorry it's it's uh one page that is packing in a lot of uh activity that we did in the past year and it was after the big workshop that we did with the 30 by 30 stuff um how about we oh uh, we revisit it um jamie when um kathleen's had a chance to review it um sure that's fine I um i i looked back last year and we didn't actually need to submit it 
usually we need to submit it in October. Last year, we didn't submit have to submit it until November. So um, we should have some more time, um, I think. Okay. After. But I don't think there's a, a huge rush. Um, so we can kind of get final confirmation at the October meeting, if that works. Great. Okay. So the next thing is um, committee term limits, which the town council um, approved um, or adopted. And this is about uh, what it says, no more than three consecutive full terms. Um, there was also a section in this uh, a piece that is not listed in, on our agenda, which is having um, a member of the planning board uh, be a li liaison to the Conservation Commission. So um, we have three people, we we've pretty well stacked ourselves in terms of terms, um, and we have three people whose terms are up this year. Um, I believe all are eligible for a renewal of their term. Um, Pete's term is up in 2025, and uh, I think he's going to be the one we're going to lose on this commission uh, because of this new um, uh, this new rule. Um, but we also have um, we also have a current vacancy um, as a second alternate, and um, we are open to. Um, applications. So any members of the public who are interested in joining the Conservation <laughs> Committee <laughs> help us oh. advance our issues are welcome to apply. <laughs> that was a really good plug. Thank you. Nicely done. I don't know if it's okay. <laughs> um, okay, and then uh, any questions about terms? Um, what do we do um, about? The, I I just want to mention the one thing I need some clarification on. It might be Marla, since you were a previous member of the of PMAC and PMAC became Conservation Commission or was absorbed by Conservation Commission. I don't think that's going to be an issue. Um, because yeah, I, I feel like on the Conservation we, Commission. I feel like we had Marla and uh, Rita newly. Um, inducted. Really appointed. The, yeah, so I don't think your previous service on PMAC is going to affect conservation. Let's just say it doesn't. Okay. Let's just say it doesn't. <laughs> There's no real um, arbiter of that other than, you know, somebody complaining. So I think that we're probably good. Yeah, we, I, I just technically, we did have them, Marla and Rita. Uh, appointed as new members of the commission. So that's true. Um, I don't think that's the technicality we're looking at. Um, and oh, uh, so we have the the new, the alternate position. And um, I, it seems like at the end of 2025, Pete will be vacate, will have to vacate. Um, He's served so many years and it's just been wonderful. And he's such a valued member of this commission. It's going to be hard to uh, lose him. Anybody on this commission, of course, but um, we all know how much we appreciate Pete's contributions. Um, can we, uh, yes, Bennett and then Autumn, but I also want to talk about this planning board representative and see when that's going to happen. So, uh, Bennett? Just really quick about Pete. Uh, it's only one year he has to be off for, right? True. Yeah. You just, yeah. If he wants right. to return. Just yes. Saying. Okay. Assuming there's a vacancy, <laughs> he wants to return. Uh, good point. Uh, Autumn and then Maggie. I was just going to ask about the planning board liaison to Randy, because I was curious if, if it had to be because Bennett's an alternate on planning board, can he? But he's a member on conservation. Can he be the planning board liaison, or do we need another planning board liaison? That's why I was trying to. Jamie, have you had a chance to talk to Tody at all about that, or Karen? What What, what do you? What was your? Thing? Yeah, so are we I in mean, two? I would say first of all, this was just something I wanted to put in place. So I'm yeah, super yeah. Place. But I was also super happy that I was willing to, I was able to get Bennett to do this without having to put something in place. 
So right. my personal opinion is like, I created this position if we're in a situation where we have no connection. So if Bennett stops serving on planning board, if if he stops serving on conservation commission, I'd be like, oh, by the way, we still don't have this. I no, again, no one's going to be knocking on the door going, where's your liaison? I, I And so I think there was some concern that he can't be a member and a liaison. That was a concern. Because okay. I asked that. I was like, can Bennett just be both? And they were kind of like, no. Yeah. My personal opinion is this is in place. Unless someone's telling you to do it, I, I would like to continue if Bennett's okay with that. <laughs> just having him serve as both. And then it's just in place. So then when we don't have that situation, um, it's there. And just for the record, I did ask Pete to apply to planning board and he declined. <laughs> I know. Well, I know that's why I was asking because I know that came up in transfer <laughs> transportation. So like Jen Ladd is on planning board, but she's the transportation chair, but she couldn't be the transportation liaison from planning board. So we have Roger. So I think I'm thinking I'm going to need to tell the planning board to appoint a liaison to the conservation commission. Yeah, it feel, like I don't know that we had that formalized. Um, I don't know I think that that's what they'll probably tell me to do. Yeah, and and let's see well, who tells you to do it. But then, <laughs> but then also like so, Bennett, I'm putting a plug in for you. Like if you get moved up to a full planning board member instead of alternate, you could, I guess, drop off from conservation commission, and then you'd be the liaison from planning board. That's where I was kind of wonder is, is does what is the alternate other than not being able to vote when there's not people there? Does that limit me from being a liaison in certain situations? How does that work? I'm not. And I'm, I'm technically an alternate on the commission as well. Say that. Oh. Okay. And, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm currently second alternate on the planning board, but there is no first alternate currently. So it's yeah, a little. Yeah, I don't so know we don't how have it's I'm not sure. I'm going to have to talk to Tony. Yeah, about there's that. been a lot of confusion around this in certain a couple of the new ordinances. <laughs> Give us a little time. And even um, without the these technicalities, I don't know that we've officially um, asked Bennett to take certain things to planning board and asked for a report from Bennett from the planning board. So when we get to that place, we can do some more official exchange like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to do that, but I think if I bring anything from, you know, I can bring my perspectives from these meetings, but unless the commission officially approves a statement, I don't want to speak for the commission at planning board. I can speak for myself and what I've seen at the commission from my own personal perspectives, but I have to have a voted on statement or something that the commission has officially authorized me to say on their behalf, even if, you know, if, it, even if I'm part of it, in order to have anything I say at planning board have the weight of the commission. You know, I, I don't want to just speak for the commission without, even if it's a general sense that I believe everyone believes in, I, I, I don't want to, yeah, I can't just say the commission says this. I'm not the commission. I'm just, you know, an alternate. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Yeah, I guess that's a little bit like Maggie serving on open space, but um, we can figure that out later. Maggie, you've had your hand up. Yeah, um, there was not. There would be nothing stopping us from asking Pete if we needed his expertise on something to no. uh, to serve only, as a kind of consultant. Only Pete's if, response. If you if you <laughs> yeah, were willing and, to do that, right? And he's welcome right. to continue coming to the meetings. They're all public. So exactly. um, and in our in the um, the charge, we are able to bring on kind of like temporary members for certain purposes and things like that, um, who aren't official members, but that they come and participate on a regular basis. So I think a lot's going to depend on Pete and what his, like what his availability um, and interest is. So we'll, we'll see, hopefully he'll remain involved because he is a really valuable reset resource to this commission. All right, let's move to, thank you all. Um, let's move to updates, education subcommittee. Um, Kathleen, Marla. Um, I am gonna report out just, um, well, 
One, I want to just commend Marla for the hard work that she did to organize the event that we hosted at the Scarborough Public Library. Um, Dr. Beverly Johnson gave a talk on August 6th and it was well attended and very well received. And Marla did like 99% of the work on that. So um, I just want to say that that was a that was a great event and um thank you to those of you who were able to make it um it was it was a good opportunity for the community to hear some really good science um in a very accessible way so um if you weren't <laughs> able to make it it's a great uh i think was it recorded it was recorded yes on um, it's on youtube on the public access station is that right Yes, um, it should be on the library's YouTube channel. Oh, on the library. Great. And then we are certainly um, ready to work on any kind of, um, you know, if there's any information that we want to put out as a commission around the land bond, um, like letters to the editor or anything like that, if there's some way that we want to um put out a statement somehow we, i'm certainly happy to work on that or um i know that there are other people working specifically on that so but that's certainly a thing that we are available and interested in doing thanks kathleen um jessica the parks and conservation land board is working on a fact sheet related to the accomplishments of the historic land bond so we should probably coordinate with the pclb should probably coordinate with the education Co committee to disseminate that piece and amplify amplify the findings so um i will forward that to you uh when it's ready Thank you, Jessica. And um, thanks, Kathleen, for recognizing Marla's great work. She It, it was a really fantastic um, session. Dr. Johnson is an exceptional speaker, uh, really fascinating information. And um, I also was reminded um, in reflecting on that session that, I don't know, like the first two or three questions for Dr. Johnson were about pesticides as they get into the marsh so um which wasn't necessarily the topic of her her discussion but um it's on residents minds um that was an excellent session thank you uh town council update sure so as randy mentioned we do have an opening on the conservation permission so if you have any like-minded friends that are interested um we also have an Planning board opening, same thing, like-minded friends who want to apply to the planning board. Um, I had asked Pete, he declined, but you know we have another year to work on him. I also just wanted to mention, I think I mentioned earlier, I'm already thinking about our January goal setting session just because I really want to be on point about the specific things that I would like to work on in the coming years, the um, year, year. And um, you guys amazingly gave me the 30 by 30, which has continued on and been like an amazing goal that I just think has been so great. So I just, I want to, you guys to individually think if there's anything that you think would be a good initiative, any new ordinances, ordinance changes that you really think would go in line with kind of the path that we're on these days. I would love to hear it. Um, you guys are feeding me this great information that I've been able to convince and get this council behind. And so I'd love to continue that trend. Um, we also had the Gorm Connector Workshop, so and I just wanted to briefly touch on that because I know that you guys submitted a couple questions. Um, it was an interesting workshop. It, I mean, I think I'll actually start with like the, my, my last comment was that the M MTA recommended to its board to push this back, take this off of their current five-year capital plan, and they are just, in my opinion, they seem very disorganized. They're all over the place. They didn't answer a lot of questions. Um, they are maybe rethinking the whole thing. Um, I know that the, the the Conservation Commission had specific questions about the greenhouse gas emissions. The information we got that in 2019, it showed that it went down, but the testing, the testing they did in 2023 said it's actually gonna go up by a half percent. So it's gonna increase the, their latest testing. So that answers your current question about the gas, greenhouse gas emissions. 
Not a great answer, not what we want to hear. Then in response, they're like, oh, well, we'll mitigate this. Again, not a fan. Um, I think then you guys also asked was, is there going to be a design to avoid the impact on the Redbrook? And I think that flows into your next question of does the commission request that the MTA complete an environmental impact study? So there was a long conversation about the third party review is the US Army Corps of Engineers. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Jamie, I'm looking at you. Well, that's, yeah, for wetlands. Um, right, and so and so what, what they're saying, and this is, I felt like a little bit of a shove off from them is they're like, well, that's not our job. Once we submit the permit, the US Army of Engineers will decide what type of studies and what type of further studying needs to be done. So um, it, I felt like it was a little brush off of them, like not taking responsibility about like what this impact, what they already know the impact is. They would not really speak to it. They're like, that's the, the course job. Um, that's literally the conversation. Didn't think it was a great workshop. Pretty much don't know where this is going, but I just wanted you guys to know that your questions were answered and addressed. And the council will be voting on a resolution <laughs> at the you. next meeting on yes, whether we, or not we attempted to do a resolution that day, which we failed. And if you read the newspaper, you read all about it. Um, and so on our next agenda for next week, there is a resolution for us to basically come out and not in support of this. Great. Thank you. And we will have new members of the council elected um, in November, um, and it'll be interesting to meet them. So, yeah. Yes, there's so there's three people running for two spots. I would get to know your candidates because they have some of them have like minds like us, and some do not. So, so and just as note related to that, it's actually candidates' night right now. That's what's happening on the other oh. side of the all in, in chambers. Um, so uh, it is being recorded. So you'll be able to go back um, after the fact and and watch the uh, the discussion. Um, so I, as Karen said, I, I encourage you to do that to learn a little bit more about the candidates. Um, Thank you. Uh, Jamie's Sustainability Committee. Yeah, so the Sustainability Committee is um, working on getting ready for Sustainable Scarborough Day, which is in a week and a half on October 6th. Um, and the other item that they are working on is looking at uh, modifications to the EV charging ordinance um, based on some uh, feedback uh, from related to large retailers who um, are the most heavily, probably the most heavily impacted um, kind of land use and large retail is anything over 25,000 square feet. So um, just kind of going back and reevaluating the, the numbers and the requirements in there to see um, what modifications make sense, if any, um, it is looking like they um, are going to modify that somewhat scale back uh, some of the, the required numbers of EV chargers. It was a pretty aggressive um, number that was in the original ordinance. Um, and then uh, related to sustainability committee, we'll be applying for a community action grant to um, develop a climate action plan. So that's kind of um, the, the third phase of our, um, our planning projects that um, we're working on. So open space plan, vulnerability assessment, and then uh, wrapping it all together in a climate action plan. Very cool. Um, Anything to add about open space plan and vulnerability assessment? <laughs> um, yeah, I can give a quick update on open space. Um, and Maggie, feel free to chime in. I did want to share that um, we are getting closer and closer to our number um, for 30 by 30. So we thought we had it at this meeting. And then Andrew shared that we actually have more conserved land than our consultant was counting. So we're actually, our number is going to get a little bit better. But right now it's looking like um, with in our conserved and protected land, we're at about 20% of Scarborough. So we have 10% um, to go to achieve 30 by 30, which is um, roughly 3,000 acres, um, okay. which is still significant, but it's, you know. Yeah. We, when we first did this process as a commission, 
as staff, we were thinking we were around 15% conserved. The number our consultants first gave us said that we were 25% conserved. So this 20% number seems much Landing. better. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we still need uh, community input on the survey that's out there. Um, so I hope every commissioner has completed that survey and I'm asking you all, um, I will, I can send out the link as well. Um, I know I've sent it in the past, but I'm happy to resend it to share that with um, your fellow Scarborough uh, neighbors and anyone who spends time in Scarborough. Um, that's really going to help us set priorities for the future. Um, and so it's really important that we get community feedback. We our goal is to have at least 300 responses to that survey, and we're currently at 85. So we okay. really need some more, um, some more uh, input and feedback on that survey. Okay. Can oh, and I'll just. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, Maggie. Anything else? Okay. Um, oh, I think I you wanted to. Also, oh, go ahead. The only other thing is that we're we seem to be on on track to have this with the consultants to have this finished and ready for something to be reviewed by January, I believe, or is it December? It may even be December. Yeah. So the committee will get it get a draft probably um, in November um, for review, and then um, it will be put out for kind of public review and comment um, in late November, early December. Um, and the whole thing should be wrapped up hopefully by February 2025. So moving right along. Um, and I also just wanted to give a quick update on the vulnerability assessment. We just had our neighborhood meeting with Pine Point last night. We had a neighborhood meeting with Higgins, the Higgins Beach community at the beginning of September. Those meetings were both really well attended. We had 60 people from Higgins and 50 people from Pine Point kind of talking about um, what those areas are going to face over the next 80 or so years and some adaptation strategies that the town um, and residents should be considering. Um, that Those meetings followed up a public meeting that was held in, um, in August uh, and the uh, kind of initial, um, the, the product, work product from the vulnerability assessment is going to be a story map where people can kind of go in and see what the, projections look like, um, what, you know, we're, we should be planning for in terms of sea level rise um, and storm surge. And um, so we'll have a, the story map will be released um, in the new year for people to start looking at. Um, and that will work going to start working on adaptation strategies, um, what we should be kind of planning for and thinking about um, to make our infrastructure and our neighborhoods more resilient. Um, and everything for that project should hopefully be wrapped up um, mid-summer 2025. Great, thank you. Lots of good work being done. Yeah. Great. Right. I think that's the end of our, all of our agenda topics, unless anyone has any last words to share. Uh, I just hope to see people at Sustainable Scarborough Day. <laughs> On October Yeah, it's 6th. great to see the banner yeah. over um, Gorham Road. Yeah. Yep. There is a banner. <laughs> Please join us. I could go into how awesome it's going to be, but it'll be bigger than last year. So. Oh, I wanted to say something. So I'm planning on being there so I can help out um, at some Thank point. You, I'll be in touch with you, Jamie. But I wanted to say the main marimba ensemble is going to be there, uh -huh. right? So yes, they were they at the Common Ground Fair on Saturday, and we saw them, and people love this group this they're is, awesome they are awesome it's going to be really fun um so i'm looking forward to it awesome thank you thank you everyone for all your good work in between and uh we will see you on october 6th and on october 23rd thank you Great. thanks everyone thank you. Bye, Bye, all. happy fall, fall. <laughs>